insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 100. Fun and Games with Dan. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my strong and confident co-host, Madison Whalen. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> How you doing today, Maddie? I'm doing all right. So we're going a little off schedule. Today's a Tuesday we're recording on because we have a special guest with us today. Let me introduce our special guest. Today, discussing Fun and Games with us is Dan Worth. How are you doing today, Dan? I'm doing very well. Thank you. Thanks for having me on the show. Thank you for joining us. So Dan is a, is a resident expert on games. Um, every time we think of uh, anything that has to do with fun and games, toys, collectibles, board games, card games, Dan's our man to go to. So we're going to be asking Dan some questions about gaming. We have uh, some statistics, some information on how games affect teens. We'll be talking about that. And then we're going to be doing a uh, deep dive with uh, Dan and some of his experience and just get his general input on gaming. Before we do that, though, I do want to uh, um, suggest folks subscribe to the podcast. Uh, you can reach us uh, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, pretty much any place you can get a podcast at this point. Uh, you can get audio versions of our podcast if you look up Insights into Teens and video versions of all of our uh, network podcasts on their Insights into Things. I would also ask folks to uh, reach out, give us your feedback. You can email us <clears throat> at comments at insightsintothings.com. We're on Twitter at insights underscore things. We're available on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. On Instagram, we are at Insights Into Things, uh, or you can get links to all of those uh, social media outlets at www.insightsintothings.com. Shall we get started? Sure. All right. So, before you know, before we get too deep into things, let's let's introduce Dan again. And, and let's find out a little bit more about Dan and, and what is some of his expertise. Why don't, you, why don't you take that? Okay, so tell us a bit about your background in gaming and collecting. Sure. I have been actively collecting something since the early 70s. Um, I started with comic books, um, picked up board games uh, in the 1980s and action figures along the way. Um, pretty much just uh, all pop culture, sci-fi, monsters, um, TV, movie-related stuff. Uh, and then it's just such a wealth of just a great time for board games in general right now because there's so much out there to choose from, and it's a great subject for you guys to be talking about tonight. Okay. All righty. Uh, would you describe yourself as a collector or a dealer of classic toys? Right now, I would say it's much more of a collector. Um, some of that is by choice. Some of it is by, you know, the situation with the COVID uh, restrictions that are on us right now. It's very difficult to try to do uh, a lot of the events that we would normally do, like comic cons, toy shows, antique shows, things like that. Um we did own a store in Bethlehem for about six years. That was a toy and collectible shop. And that was, uh, a, you know, just a few years ago. Um, but right now the environment does not lend itself as easily to um, 
have people walk in or even do the conventions as much. So I am much more of a collector right now, just picking up things that I think are going to be of interest to the group that I game with. Alrighty, that kind of leads well into our second question. So, how long did you own your gaming slash toy store? It was about six years. Um, we had a, a really good run in downtown Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Uh, we had a variety of collectibles from comic books to um, action figures, board games, of course, certain card games like uh, Magic and Pokemon and, you know, some of the uh, mainstream stuff that you'll see. And we tried to really pick some obscure things as well that we would pick up at, you know, major toy shows like the New York Toy Show that's uh, at the Javits Center and just odds and ends that we would find in our travels. So, Dan, you mentioned uh, comics at the store. Are you a comic aficionado or a comic collector? What's your affiliation with comics? I would say that is primarily where my heart lies, Joe. Uh, my collection started with Marvel, um, specifically with Spider-Man. Um, I started with uh, Spider-Man number 96 in 1971. Back in the olden days, yes, they did have comic books back then. Um, and it was that first comic book that led me to get all the rest of those and a lot of the other major Marvel comics. Um, so I would consider myself primarily a comic book collector. But as it's turned out, and as we'll talk about, um, it's hard to ignore the fact that I've got a very large collection of board games. So I have to ask you on the subject of comics, are you just Marvel? Are you DC? Are you indie? Where, where do you usually lie in that, in that realm? Uh, my loyalties have gotten much broader over the years. Uh, I am not afraid to expand into some of the DC comics. Uh, I also love a lot of independent comics and have loved a lot of independent comics over the years. Um, we, we have those folks to thank for the Teenage Ninja Mutant Turtles. We have them to thank for The Walking Dead, um, The Boys, um, a lot of the stuff that's out there right now that is so popular um, is a result of independence. And that's, it's a huge faction in the comic book world. Yeah, I, I agree 100% there. What's our next question? Um, our next question was, do you still sell toys? I do. It's more of an online sales technique that we use. You know, we do some eBay. Uh, we still sell some things through our Facebook page for the underground layer. Uh, but right now, I'm much more of a collector than a seller. All right. So picture this scenario. So picture the scenario where. So what did you go to game at a party where the participants might not be it big on gaming? That's a great question because, you know, you're, you're going to have a wide variety of people at things like that. And you want to get something that's going to appeal to everyone. I like things like apples to apples. That's a great general, easy board game to, to, you know, teach people. I know it's basically cards, but, uh, I think we have to really expand the way that we're thinking about this category to include some of that stuff. Um, and you can't mention apples to apples without the adult version of also Cards Against Humanity, which has just become so huge of a product over the last couple of years and immensely popular and has really gotten people who wouldn't normally do gaming nights to do some gaming nights. Uh, when we would go to uh, the, the various uh, toy shows that would introduce us to new games, some of the companies that we found that really grabbed us were uh, companies like Calliope, who is responsible for Roll For It, which is a great party game. Uh, you can play it up to um, five people. Um, it's a dice rolling game where you're trying to win cards. Um, the, the other one that they did that we really love is Sorrow and Sorrow of the Seas, which was a very creative take on a board game where you are sailing on ships, creating paths for yourself but also trying to cut off your opponents and be the last man standing on the board. 
Um, another one that's great for parties and that we have found over the years really helps people break the ice is a game called Outburst. Um, that's by, um, uh, it's a, a, a nice shout out game where people don't have to be shy about it. You know, you're trying to come up with answers as fast as you can. Uh, there's another one that just came out recently called Code Names, which is of the same flavor um, by a company called CGE. And that's gotten a lot of popularity and there's a lot of different versions of that one out there as well. Great. That's a, that's a lot of great suggestions. Um, next is a pretty big question. How many games would you estimate you currently own? (laughs) Uh, this was an eye opening question for me, um, because I don't think I realized how many games I had, but just in the house right now, uh, we have close to a hundred. Wow. So I would say easily we have over 200 different kinds of board games. I am not counting uh, the card games in that. So, or, or just the strict dice games like Yahtzee and uh, you know, magic, the gathering and some of the other stuff like that, that is a whole nother category. We're not going to count the role playing games as well, like D and D or. Or. Other. Again, another totally different category. And and that would be why Dan's on this show, because Dan is the expert on <laughs> games. Yep. <laughs> what else do we have? Okay, next one is, what do you find to be the most important thing that games offer to individuals? One of the great things about board games is that it brings people together, has them sitting in close proximity and exchanging looks and smiles and jokes. And that's been one of the great things that my friends and I have shared over the years with sitting around playing a board game is as much as it might be competitive, you're also laughing and joking and talking. Uh, It's a great way to just have a nice uh, camaraderie and have people come together over, you know, something that's a neutral ground and, and you enjoy doing. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, now to kind of go along with that question, what do you find is the most important thing that collecting offers to individuals? I find that both for myself and to all my friends who collect and the people that used to come into the underground lair, um, there's always that feeling of taking you back to your childhood, to taking you to fond memories, and and just you know warming your heart when you see some of these things that you grew up with uh and it's right there in your hands again and it and it really sparks a lot of memories and as well as some people will say you know the collecting aspect of it can be monetarily beneficial um you can make a lot of money with you know buying older board games or rare board games um I find much more often that it's that sense of nostalgia more than anything else that brings people back to some of those classic board games. And I have to agree with you a hundred percent there. Every time I stepped in the store, uh, it, it, I was a kid again, stepping in, you know, it was, let's look around, let's see what I can find here that, that brings me back all those years. And, and for me, from a collecting standpoint, it's, it's almost it's the hunt that's so rewarding. Like I know there's a piece that I want, you know, I'm a, as you know, a, a big star Wars collector. And when there's a piece that I find, you know, we had gone to, uh, the one, uh, show out in, uh, I was it out in bucks out where the, the, um, the fuse is the and, huge. Yeah. yeah. And there was a, um, a, a piece, uh, from the nineties. It was a, it was a Darth Vader statue that I had been looking for for years and I hadn't found it anywhere. Hadn't been on the market anywhere. Can't find it on the internet. Nothing. I mean, when you can't find it on eBay, you know, you're in trouble Mm -hmm. Uh, and lo and behold, it was there top of the pile on display in the back corner. And I found it and instantly bought it because that was the piece that I had been looking for for so long. So, and it was so, you you have to think that that's that feeling that Indiana Jones has every time he finds a relic Absolutely. because the joy of that 
moment of finding that rare thing out in the wild is there, there's nothing quite like it. So Madison also, I would say it's a thrill of the hunt. Like uh, your dad is saying it's, it's that adventure. And I, for many years had my own versions of Belloc when I was out at flea markets and yard sales and we would run into each other and we would just show off what we had found and like, Oh, once again, we see that what you once possessed is now, yeah, you know, it's, <laughs> well, there's that aspect too, but um, it's, it's just fun and, and, and good hearted uh, ribbing. Um, but man, it is exciting when you can find that one rare thing yeah, that you've been absolutely. looking for for so long. And, and we all certainly have them. Yep. Yep. Well, maybe not you yet, Madison, but you will. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what else do we have, sweetie? So the next question is, what do you enjoy most about sharing a new game with people? I love the expressions on people's faces when they're getting pulled into the spirit of the game and uh, that sense of joining on an adventure. I can tell you that one of the most fun things, and, and, and I'm going to bring this home to like a personal aspect. Uh, when one of the first times when your, your mom and dad and I would play a board game, like the Buffy game, uh, Buffy, the vampire slayer, uh, it was very exciting to see, you know, the interactions of the characters and, and not know what situations are going to come up and then remember, Remember what had happened on the show and you know it was just such a blast to to share those laughs and then you tell stories and it just makes it a very interesting evening around a board game to to be able to share that yep i definitely <laughs> i remember a lot of i remember a lot of times when i don't particularly like new things i will be honest i don't like change very much but when um i had well, when I first learned about Monopoly, I didn't want to put the game down. It just was so fun to me. And, like, at first I was kind of like, uh, I don't know if I want to play this. And then by the end, I'm like, okay, come on. <laughs> I want to yeah, keep going. Yeah, we, we went through our Monopoly phase where we would play that nightly for a couple of weeks straight. And uh, the worst part was I would win a lot of them and everyone would get angry at me. So. <laughs> <laughs> What's next? Uh, next is, have you ever done reviews for games? That's something that I haven't done yet. I do have friends that do that, um, but we haven't actually sat down and done the reviews. I've watched a few of them. I can't mention, you know, the names off the top of my head, but I know that that is a lot of times an invaluable service to be able to see the game being played, to understand, you know, what you're getting in for, um, before you make that purchase. Um, and let me just mention at this point, something else that people are going to find when they go to buy some of these board games, the price point nowadays is a little bit different than it used to be. I think the average right now is somewhere from the 60 to $80 range. So when you're spending that much money, game reviews are invaluable to be able to see if it's something you're going to enjoy when you're investing that much money in something new, like you said, Madison, if you, especially if you don't like something new, you want to make sure that it's something that you really are going to like. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Definitely. Um, kind of going along with that question, have you ever created toys professionally? I have. That was one of the services that we offered at the underground layer. And I had been doing it, you know, in a much more amateur sense for years leading up to that, um, I would do it for friends who would be cleaning out a, a, a relative's attic or a basement or, you know, would be ready to get rid of their collection and want to know, hey, do I have anything here that I can, you know, maybe make some money on? Um, and and that's something that I've always been up on. I know, you know, the grading system of a lot of the board games and comic books and action figures. So it was a service that we definitely wanted to offer at the underground layer. Okay. Um, our last question we have is, do you do game and toy shows? If so, is the chance, is the choice show for a collect, what, if so, what is the choice show for collectors to go to in the area? 
Great question. And there are, we are really lucky in that we have a couple of premier toy shows in our area. Um, some of my favorites, um, and again, we're, we're going to have to talk about this from outside of a COVID situation. You know, if it was a normal year, regular, you know, events being planned, these would be the places that you would want to hit. Um, one of the first ones that I always go to is the Allentown Ag Hall Toy Show, um, which is the first Saturday of every November. And it's a mixture of antiques up to current day, you know, action figures and board games. It's relatively inexpensive to get into. I think it was only like five bucks or seven bucks to walk in. And they just have aisles and aisles of really fun vintage stuff that you might not see anywhere else. Uh, the other one was um, the Lehigh Valley Comic Con is also in Allentown. There you'll see a good mix of comic books, board games, action figures, a little bit of everything. Uh, there's ZoloCon in Warminster, PA, uh, which is the other name for the Fuge, Joe. Yep. yep. Uh, again a fabulous show in just a fantastic sci-fi realistic um you know it, it walks that line between you know fantasy and reality that just adds to that ambiance of being that um the other one was retrocon in um oaks pa yeah and then the toy con in New Jersey at Atlantic city. That one, I think we've never been to that one. That's, that's a really big one, Joe. Um, that's, uh, again, it's kind of like a, a good mix of antiques and new stuff, but it's much more of the older stuff and in much more quantities. Right. So on that, on that note, um, what about the comic cons? You know, we've get, we get wizard world in the area. We get uh, New York comic con. Are these some of the premier shows? Yeah. Are, are these some place that a collector would go or are they more contemporary vendors that you have there? You're going to have more contemporary vendors. You're going to have people that know what they're doing. Um, you're not going to find as many bargains, but you may find that oddball item that you've been looking for that you won't find anywhere else because you're drawing people from all around the world, not just our country, but from all around the world at some of these big shows like the New York Comic Con, which has grown to the point where it's kind of overshadowing the San Diego Comic Con, which has been the premier show that everyone's wanted to go to for decades. Uh, so that's the advantage to going to one of those big major shows is you will get a cross section of everything from around the world and dealers who you might not normally see at the smaller venues. Yeah. What about the convention exclusives at these big Comic-Con conventions? Are they something that a collector, is that an entry point for a collector or is that gimmicky more than a, a real collectible? Boy, that's, that's a tough line to walk because you know as well as I do, being a completist, it's tough to pass those up yeah. because where else are you going to find them? Yeah. Uh, you know, when you see those con exclusives and I mean, my desire for them is always mixed with how cool is the item actually? Uh, you know, I can I can maybe let one go if it's not necessarily something I would collect, you know, on the, on the regular, uh, I'm a big Spider-Man fan. So Spider-Man is one of my, my weak spots. So I, I do like Spider-Man villains and, you know, characters, but if you're going to give me like the fifth J Jonah Jameson figure as a con exclusive, I'm probably going to pass. Right. Right. Well, that was all we have for this segment. Stay with us. We'll be back in a minute and uh, talk about what the importance of gaming is for teens. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. 
we're family. Join us on the StarForge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit nope. us on the web today. Just watching the fun Star Wars stuff. www.thesecondsithempire.com Welcome back to Insights into Teens. This is episode 100, Fun and Games with Dan. So games have an important part in our lives. They, they bring the family together. They bring the friends together, like Dan had mentioned. They give us some, some uh, camaraderie. And, and you can even learn from games to a certain extent. So we had uh, you had gone out and done some research on this. Why don't you tell us about what your findings were in your research? Okay, so um, this research comes from a site that we haven't used called yourmom.com. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I had to get that out. It, it actually is youaremom.com, oh. not your mom, but, <laughs> but okay. <laughs> uh, uh, sorry. Um, this is the fun and gains <laughs> podcast, so that's okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So on to the research. So games are are uh, games are key to the person to the personal development of youth during adolescence and offer a number of benefits. Playing games allows young people to learn and have fun. Games can also be used as a means of distraction and personal growth. The most popular games for teens are those th that provide challenges to the mind. Some examples are strategy games, puzzle games like Tetris, Candy Crush, To Zoom To Zoom, board games like Monopoly, Clue, and The Game of Life, and word games like Scattergories, Scrabble, Words with Friends, and Boggle. Um, games are are truly a privileged tool that allows for de the development of a positive attitude that can accompany teens for the rest of their lives. Playing games combines, pl combines pleasure, participation, creativity, and experience. So, Dan, would you agree that these benefits are benefits that you can get from board games? Absolutely. Um, along with that, I think... Um, just the idea of some of these games where you're utilizing strategy, you have to use logic and forethought. Um, all of those are great skills for teens to have um, going for, further into their life, just with life lessons. It keep, teaches you creative thinking and abstract thinking, um, as well as sometimes teaching you history and basics like finance and monopoly. Yeah, that's a very good point. Now, the, the research that was done suggests that teens want games that give them a challenge. Do you find that to be the case in your experience? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because if something's too easy, you're going to get bored with it. And how long is that interest going to be held? Uh, the game has to be challenging. It has to push you a little bit. It has to move you out of your comfort zone. Um and I think those are really important elements for any successful board game. Are besides the ones that we listed here, are there any other games that you're familiar with at this time that you think would be ideal games that you would suggest for teens that provide that level of challenge combined with that, that additional benefit of an educational experience? There's a lot of really good um, historical battle games out there right now. Um, some of which have lasted for a couple of decades. Uh, there was a series called uh, the Game Master series by Milton Bradley, which is one of the first ones that I started with. And that was back in the 80s. And that was, you know, our early gaming days. But as, as you can probably see in the background there, we have uh, Axis and Allies, which is the World War II version, which helps you recreate some of the famous battle scenarios of that era. Um, but there's also ones that were civil war oriented. There were revolutionary war oriented ones that teach about history. Uh, and again, we can go back to just 
things like word building and things like Scrabble. And as, as Madison mentioned, Boggle and some of those games that teach, you know, basic spelling, memorization, mind strength, uh, all very important for a young mind that's growing and learning. So do you think it's possible that you can play too many games? Well, I think like anything, moderation is the key. Um, I feel the same way about video games. I've never felt negatively about video games, but if you're spending more time on that than you are in the rest of your life, you've got to create a balance. And the same thing with board games. Um, you know, you want to have moderation and, you know, not d dedicate hours and hours out of a day to it. But I have in the past with some of these other games, some of them can last, you know, four or five hours. Um, but are you going to do it every night? Because that would be, you know, pushing it. Yeah, that 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 could be dangerous. I do remember. Uh, our six and eight hour Star Wars miniature weekend. <laughs> <laughs> That's not something you would want to have as your life going, you know, every night. No, no, not unless you're getting paid to do it as a play tester or something. Like right. That. Right. Um, so let's, you know, we talked about a couple of mostly um, games that are group involved games. Um, but there's, there's benefits to individual games too, especially given the current environment that we're in where we can't all get together. Are there any games out there that you could suggest to somebody who doesn't have that advantage of, of getting together with someone? I'm really glad you brought that up because that was going to be a point that I was going to bring up at the end of this as well. Uh, with the current environment, it's very difficult to have game nights and to be able to get together with my friends. And I'm sure everyone is experiencing the same thing. So, what do you do if you want to continue to play a board game? What can you do on your own? Are there solo board games out there? And yes, there are. Uh, some of the ones that I was able to find were um, things like the Escape the Room series. Uh, it's not easy to do those on your own, but you can. Um, there's another great series called Choose Your Own Adventure, which is by Z-Man. And those are based on those books that you and I probably remember more than anybody, Joe, uh, where you would page through the book and you're reading it. And at the bottom, it would give you a choice of what page you would go to if you chose this and what page you would go to if you chose that. So they've created solo games in that fashion. And I did want to mention one other thing that I discovered this past year, because, again, I really wanted to find something that I could do on my own. Um, without having to do, you know, a get together. And I found on Kickstarter, uh, and I'm very excited about this. It's going to be coming out in May, a game called final girl, where you play against the game, a solo, it's a solo version of a game where you are the final girl in a horror movie. And there are different scenarios with different types of, uh, you know, axe murderers and horror characters that are very similar to like your Freddy Kruegers and Jasons and things like that. And you have your final girl who's trying to rescue people around the lake or around the house while being chased by this maniac. And it's you against the clock and against this character. And it's a solo adventure. And, I'm, and it sounds like it's going to be fantastic. Um, and that's coming out May of this year. Well, that's very cool. That does that sounds very interesting. So I know we've done um, Zoom calls a lot to, to keep the family together, special occasions, stuff like that. And, you know, whenever we get together as a family, we always play a game. You know, thanks to you, <laughs> pretty much. You've always got games with you when, whenever we get together. So on Zoom, there have been some options that we've been able to translate that into another entertaining experience. Do you have any suggestions like that for people who can't get together but still want to play group games like that where they can sort of capture some of that magic? Any Any suggestions on that? I'm trying to think of what some of the ones were. I think there's one that was called, and, and forgive me if I get this wrong, Jackbox. Yes. Um, yes. I, 
options. They they don't just have one type of game. And it's like a multiplayer uh, online, you know, participation. But there's a whole variety of different games that you can choose from. And then you accumulate points by either winning or succeeding in each one of those games. And then you get to do something at the end with those accumulated points. And, and it's just that's been a blast. We've done that already sitting in the same room on our phones so you could easily do it from a distance remotely i i also heard this vicious rumor that you uh you play words with friends with someone from our house too <laughs> those rumors can be confirmed um i i am rather fond of that uh there are, are a handful of people that i do play with that with um, and I have found that to be a lot of fun and it, it takes me back to my Scrabble playing days and, you know, it's, it can be rough. It can be brutal. <laughs> I've taken some really hard losses, um, some humiliating losses, some would say. So I've learned, I've gotten better, That's but great. it's, it's a lot of fun. I, yeah, I enjoy it. That's great. So we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back and we're going to do a deep dive on, uh, Dan and his history and a little bit more detail on what his gaming uh, prowess really reflects. So we'll be right back. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights into Teens. We're talking fun and games with Dan. So deep dive on Dan here. I guess the first question I have to ask is how old were you when you started getting into gaming and collecting? The actual collecting aspect of it didn't happen until I reached college. And up until then, I was a very hardcore comic book and action figure collector and had an extensive collection of the marvels dating back into the 1960s all the major titles and all of the action figures that had been produced at that time and it was a much more meager selection during the 70s and 80s than it is now where it is just a plethora of choices out there to make as far as action figures um but when we got to college uh we did there were two things that i became involved in one of them was the wonderful world of D and D, which I got to play for the first time with a group because growing up, none of my friends knew how to play. So it's very difficult to learn to play D and D on your own when you have no one else to play with. Um, so that was the one thing that I kind of became involved in. And then the other one was the, like I mentioned earlier, the Milton Bradley game master series, which were all based on classic eras of classic battles throughout history. They had Conquest of the Empire, which was the Roman Empire's uh, attempt to take over the world. There was uh, Axis and Allies, which was the World War II version. There was Shogun, which was the feudal Japan version. And they had a one, another one called Broadsides and Boarding Parties, which was a tall ship uh, sort of a pirate kind of version where you would chase each other around in ships on the board and you would get to a point where you would do a broadsides with each other if you were next to each other and then you had characters that could actually attack each other from the ships um so those types of military strategy games were a big part 
of my formative game playing years. Very interesting. So, um, what games were popular when you were a teen? Um, just the classics. I think when I was a teen, I was trying to go back and look at some of the dates so that I could be a little bit more sure about when I was a teen. Um, so, uh, other than like Monopoly and, and Scrabble and some of those other ones, um, again, really what kind of caught our eye and what came into popularity during that era were games like Trivial Pursuit, which was absolutely huge when I was um, getting out of high school, going into college, uh, the late 70s, early 80s. I think the first Trivial Pursuit games came out actually in the early 80s. Um, but those were were so huge. Um Games like uh, Scategories and Taboo and some of those were just immensely popular at all the parties and things that we would go to. Um, other board games, uh, I know my sisters and I, because I had two younger sisters, we would play, you know, Life and a game called Careers, which is basically you choose an occupation and you try to become successful at it and it was very straightforward kind of like a little bit more involved than life uh but it was a lot of fun um and then just some of the classics like i said like uh clue and uh monopoly and life and some of those other ones interesting so what is the most bizarre but family friendly game that you've played Okay. Uh, one of the ones was the uh, Green Ghost game, which came out in the 60s uh, during a time when things like the Munsters and the Adams Family were very popular. Uh, and it was basically you played it in the dark, the game board glowed, a big green ghost in the center of it glowed, that's what you would spin. And then you had to go around the board and it had the board was raised about three or four inches and there were boxes underneath it and you were in the dark and you would have to reach in and identify what the items were that were in it. Kind of like the classic Halloween party game. Uh, that was a weird one. There was another one called uh, kaboom, which was uh, a way of blowing up, taking turns, pumping on a balloon that was on a, a dynamite shack. And you would go around the board and try not to get blown up by the balloon. Uh, <laughs> funny uh, yeah there was there was some great ones and then of course there was the pie in the face one which not really a board game but that was a very bizarre game too where you would take turns twisting the dials and you would get a pie in the face if you got it wrong well nowadays you, you'd never see a game like that now i mean it would wouldn't pass like safety inspection <laughs> <laughs> what's our next question so was there any was there a particular theme of a particular theme of gaming or gaming type that you were interested in? Well, I really liked the um, competitive uh, military style games. Uh, games like Stratego um, were a lot of fun. Um, and then we got more involved in like Battleship. Uh, then it came out with Subsearch, which was even better. Joe, if you remember, Star Wars did a version of that where it was three tiers of ships yes. and they just said it was like layers of space instead of like underwater. Yep. But such a great idea to like have a three dimensional, like battleship kind of game. It always struck uh, me as though they were trying to recapture like uh, three dimensional chess from, from Star Trek with something like Star that. Trek. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So we talk a lot about, we've talked a lot about classic games, are there modern games that you play now? Like, do you, would you go out and buy a game now? You know, are they still making good games? Oh, they're, they are, they are making some great ones. Um, what, besides the ones that we mentioned already, uh, there's a couple that I do want to give like honorable mentions to. And I, I feel really bad because I don't have one of these at home, but it's one that we've played all the time that we ran the underground layer. And now we have a couple of friends that have it. It's a game called Elfin Land. Um, it's a semi-cooperative game where you are a young elf going out into the world and traveling and trying to visit as many towns as you can. Um, and it's a lot trickier than it sounds, uh, because you have 
I get to travel. So it's it's a, a really interesting concept. Another game that we've enjoyed recently was the Castle Panic series, which is now they also have a Star Trek Panic. Um, they have uh, you know a bunch of other ones like Munchkin Panic, uh, and it's uh, again a semi cooperative game which we seem to be drawn to. Uh, and you and your teammates try to prevent, in the case of Castle Panic, uh, goblins and orcs and things from destroying your castle. In the Star Trek sense, you prevent the Romulans and Klingons from attacking you. Um, so that's a really fun one. That's a, a relatively new one. That's only been like the last 10 years that that's been out. Uh, there's another one called Formula D Racing, which is a huge game board with race cars on it. And as you roll different sizes of dice, depending on what gear your car is in, and you have to change your dice when you come around a corner to slow down. Um, that's been loads of fun. We have a lot of, I am infamous for crashing my car more times than not. And uh, I don't win very often. <laughs> and and knowing you, that must be painful that you don't win very often. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> I'm a I'm a gracious loser. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay, so our next question is what do you think makes a good game? Well, I think we touched upon some of that earlier in that you need to have a challenge and you need to push your limits a little bit and make it a little bit exciting. Uh there has to be um some kind of either reward that you're striving for. Uh, either cooperatively or individually. And there has to be some kind of threat or time or things moving against you that's going to cause you to have to act. And I think that represents a lot of what we have going on in life too. Yeah, (laughs) isn't that the truth? So based on those qualities, have you ever made your own game? You know, it's going to surprise you, but I have not. That's something that I haven't done. I have helped some friends with games um, in design level stuff where they needed like flavor text or character backgrounds and things like that. Um, We did a whole series uh, with a friend of mine for a sci-fi game that he hasn't been able to obtain rights to yet. So I don't really want to talk about it, but each one of the individual characters in the game that popped up on a card had a backstory and a reason why they were criminals, let's say, and had to participate in this competition. Uh, but it was, uh, it's a, it was a fun experience. Um, and I, I would like to do more of it, but probably from a, a writing standpoint as opposed to design. Sure. Sure. That makes sense. Um, so are there any games that you think are underrated? That's a tough one. There are um, a lot of games that we've really loved at the Underground Lair that we've played multiple times. And I, I will say that one of the ones that we really fell in love with was Roll For It. Um, it's such an easy game to learn and the box that it comes in, you could use it as a travel game. Um, it was a great game that we used to segue into the larger game. Like while we were waiting for everyone to show up on a game night, you could have like two or three or four people play role for it. And they would be able to get a couple of games in before someone else would even show up for the bigger game. Um, Whereas something like Munchkin, that's that's an evening, and you're going to be there for a while. So buckle yeah, up. That is true, absolutely true. So if you had to, to to pick, what is your gaming preference as far as type of game? Are you a card gamer, a board gamer? Do you like team based stuff, dice games, miniatures, role playing? What's your number one pick? Boy, that's tough, Joe. You know we've run the gamut over the years. Yeah, and. And it does seem to kind of go in trends. I mean, we were doing the um, the miniatures games for a while there, and we're really heavy into it. And and by that same token, I played Magic the Gathering for many years too, and my friends and I were really into that. And uh, what 
tells us when we need to change gears and go to a different you know type of game or or entertainment um I used to do video games too, but I just don't have time as much time for that. And, and video games, I, I know that, you know, we can do like multiplayer online stuff now, but there's something about sitting around a table at a board game that that's a little bit different than, than when you're behind a monitor. Um, and I really like, you know, laughing with the friends and exchanging jokes and, and making fun of their moves and, and stuff like that. And, uh, I forgot what the question was. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> what type of game would you pick if you could pick one? All right. Um, I would say it would probably be one of the like military strategy combat games. We've really had a lot of fun with them over the years. Okay. Um, it's a step up from risk. And I know we didn't talk about that yet, but that's not one of my favorite games. Um, but I think the idea that some of these game companies took it to the next level and really made them interesting and involved and gave you some great pieces to move around the board, because who doesn't love little plastic pieces? Um, it, it really changed changed the way that we we looked at games and what our expectations were. And, and that, those are the ones that I go to. Okay, fair enough. Alrighty, so now we're going to go back to the collecting aspect. So, what inspired you to start collecting? Well, Madison, my inspiration was to originally to accumulate the stuff that I loved, but also to try to make some money. And the reason I wanted to make some money was because one year for Christmas, I did not get my Lost in Space robot that I had asked for for consecutive years. And finally, I decided to myself, self, I'm going to buy it myself. So I started collecting things and selling them, making money, and tried to save up to buy my Lost in Space robot. That, that was the inspiration. It did not work out well. Because <laughs> <laughs> about 30 years later, before um, some of my close friends and loved ones and family members joined together to buy me said Lost in Space robot. Um, you know, it's I was making money doing my collectibles and stuff. But there's always car insurance and then college funds and then you have a family and it just never seemed the Lost in Space robot always became the, the last priority. So it was tough, but that's why I started. And ultimately you did wind up getting it, you know, eventually. ultimately I did. Yes. Yeah. And still have it. Yep. Yeah. Well, see, so everybody loves a happy ending. See, <laughs> so in addition to that one, how many collectibles do you estimate that you have? God, <laughs> you didn't count it beforehand? <laughs> counting the comic books and magic cards. Uh, I mean, just let's just say thousands, yeah, thousands of collect. Yeah, yeah. Some would, it's some it's a lot. Label, some would label that an obsession, but a healthy one. I don't. I don't like to be. You don't like labels. Blind. I don't like labels. No. <laughs> um. So, do you just collect, or do you sell on trade your items? I do trade some items and sell some items yet uh, again much more when we weren't having the restrictions that we've had i would love to be able to do comic book and toy shows again uh goodness knows i've got enough stuff so you know it's probably great to thin that out once in a while uh the other thing that we didn't really talk about earlier one of the great aspects of having the store was and joe you and i touched on this a little bit was helping other people find that one item that they're looking for yeah. and watching their face light up when that piece, that, that missing piece, like Shel Silverstein said, uh, it just fills that spot in their heart that they had as a little kid finding that toy or game or stuffed animal or whatever it was. And finally, uh, you know, having it again, it just, I don't know. It just, Gives you that warm, fuzzy feeling. So that's another reason why I really would like to get back to 
being able to give back some of the stuff. There's people out there looking for them just like Joe and I are. Yeah. And, and as a collector, I've, I've never sold any of my collectors. I, I almost got to the point. In fact, I almost brokered through you the sale of a couple of pieces. Uh, mm -hmm. and I was out of work a few years back, but fortunately, uh, the situation turned itself around and I didn't have to sell anything. Um, and, and I still hold on to, to most of the stuff I have. And, and my goal was never to, to make a, a profit on anything. It was really just to capture that nostalgia. But since you did do it semi, well, you did do it professionally because you had a store. Do you currently have any high value items that you're holding on to that you wouldn't sell? or wouldn't sell unless the conditions were ideal. Well, sure. Yeah. And, and we, we talked about that uh, a little bit earlier too, that my main obsession comic book wise is Spider-Man. So that would be probably the most valuable thing that I own is I have all of the Spider-Man comic books. Um, some of which, uh, some of you guys have gotten to hold and, and actually see. So uh, that would probably be the most expensive thing that I have. And, and I can honestly say, since I can't actually pick up my car, your one Spider-Man comic was literally the most expensive thing I've ever <laughs> held. <laughs> that's, that's a pretty safe bet for a lot of people. Yeah. 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 And uh, very good condition. And I, and I assume you've kept it, in as good a condition, you know, in the 10 years since I saw it. You would expect nothing less. <laughs> I, I imagine it doesn't see the light of day very often. It really doesn't. No, it's not something I take out to thumb through, you know, <laughs> for old time sake. So, um, on the subject of some of your more valuable items, what's the biggest win of a collectible you've ever managed to acquire? Hmm. Well, I would say one of my favorite things that I found was uh, as a young collector, uh, I used to frequent yard sales and, and flea markets. And my dad would would actually be running a shop uh, down in Lahaska uh, on weekends. So I would go down with him occasionally. Uh, and this was when I was still, you know, maybe eight, 10, 12 years old. And I wandered into one of the shops and uh, an older woman had a stack of comics under the counter and she allowed me to look through them. And I found one that I really wanted and I gave her a quarter and I walked out with it and walked very quickly back to my dad. And it was a Hulk number six, which um, at the time was probably only a couple of hundred dollars but it really was like one of the big wins of finding something in the wild that you never saw, you know, even behind the counter at a comic show. A lot of times that was one of the best things that I had found. Um, another one was finding a Munster's drag race game in a thrift store for $2, which I then did trade to someone at a toy show. Uh, that was probably, four or five hundred dollar game at the time wow so you know you get every once in a while you get a win yeah so you've obviously run the gambit of collectibles at this point in time comics and toys and everything else what are you into right now as far as collectibles what's your what are you targeting right now Believe it or not, it does seem like board games is one of the things that I'm uh, really kind of looking at uh we've had a lot of fun just doing our gaming nights but we're always looking for something new i know joe you've probably noticed by now even though your eyes are drawn to the return of the jedi game <laughs> but right next to that you'll see a copy of the very rare uh john carpenter's the thing game mm -hmm. and if you give me a second i'm gonna grab that for you oh i better grab this one too this was another prize this past year and and uh, god love them for coming out with something like this um let me find my camera no, there we go you're good you're good all right um the princess bride game uh it recreates all the scenarios from the movie 
and allows you to play the characters as they would have approached each challenge. So oh, you have funny. the pit of despair, you have the cliffs of insanity, you have the shrieking eels, and you have to do different things in order to get through those scenarios, and it's a lot of fun. Um, and then this one was a Christmas present that just came out uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, I had seen it at Toy Fair, tried to buy it, they were sold out, tried to buy it at Go Games, they were sold out. Then they stopped making it for a while. Mm -hmm. So this was uh, quite a find this past year. Very cool. So this is very much similar, and Madison, you might be aware of this game. Um, there's an online game called Among Us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, basically the plot of that, right? Yeah, impossible. So that's kind of the premise of the thing, and I know some of your other viewers will know that uh, – what happens is there's a bunch of scientists in the Arctic and they discover a flying saucer and there's a creature on there that takes the place of one of the people and they don't know who it is. Right. And that's the game. One of you is the creature trying to chase and eat the other ones and you either have to escape or kill the creature. And it's, it's really like intense. That's cool. That's cool. Big fan of the movie. Love the movie. Um, yeah, they did a really good job making this creepy, too. That's cool. And that's hard to do with a board game. It is. So we're, we're kind of running up against the clock here. Before we go, um, did you have any advice for someone Madison's age who might want to start collecting and doesn't really know how to get into it or is looking for a game that they might be able to play with their friend in a limited environment or anything like that? There's a there's a great selection out there. I would say one of your your options is to maybe go to some of these comic shows and collectible shows or even a comic shop and ask some of the not only the owners or people that are working behind the counter. But if you see uh, someone at a table playing a game, stick around and, and check it out, because that's a good way of seeing one of those reviews, those game reviews in person. Um there's a lot of options out there. I know that there aren't a lot of toy stores anymore, but you know, Barnes and Noble does a good job of putting a bunch of different games out there. Uh, Target does a great job. They've really, you know, kind of kept stepped up their game this past year with the board games. Um, we don't have, we don't have Kitty city. We don't have toys R us. We don't have KB toys anymore, but you know, you'll have like a go games at Christmas time that you can maybe find some cool stuff at. Um, and then just go with what you really enjoy. I mean, we've had a lot of success with that, Joe, as far as, you know, your love of Star Wars, uh, Michelle's love of Buffy, um, you know, us with, you know, any of the other games that we've brought over to you guys. Um, see what your friends like. Check it out. Um, there's such a variety of games out there right now. You're bound to find something you like. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we'll be right back and we'll get uh, Madison's closing remarks. Okay, so for my closing remarks today, I'm just going to say to everyone out there, um, play some games. You don't have to always do it with people because, of course, restricted environment, but try it out for yourself. Try out some single-player games, and if you can, try out some group games. Be creative with how you can play them, and try out new games, and see if you, and I'm sure there's something you'll like. All right, great advice. Uh, Dan, again, I want to thank you for uh, joining us today. It's been a pleasure. It's been insightful, entertaining, educational. Of course, most of the thank you so much for having me, guys. I really enjoyed it. Most of our entertainment was the your mom joke, but <laughs> <laughs> we'll take them where we can get them. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So that's it for this week. Uh, we'll be back. Uh, we won't be recording this weekend cause this will be this weekend's podcast, but we'll be back the following week. So thank you for joining us on our special 100th uh, episode and that's it. Another one in the books. Bye. Bye. Everyone.